we officially begin the Storytelling Festival, we're going to get a welcome from a woman who has a great story all of her own. She's a member of the Puyallup Tribe, and she's Assistant Professor of American Indian Studies at University of Washington, Tacoma. Let's welcome Dr. Danica Sarah Miller. Today, when we have so much division and so much pointing of fingers, instead of hand-holding, it's because in a lot of ways we've lost the stories. And it's so great to look out here and to understand that we're all here to listen, to learn, and to build our communities and ourselves and each other. Please join me in welcoming our storytellers for today. They're coming up from just down here. Let's welcome Miriam Barnett. at the YWCA, and it's why I absolutely had to have a new shelter, and I couldn't give up that, that vision, because I wanted our families to have a dining room table. I wanted them because I see that as a symbol of communication and unification and celebration. And just like me, most of our clients had never had that. And so I really was determined to make that possible. So I believe that if you really want something and you focus on it and you believe in it and set that intention, it can happen. I feel so blessed that the YWCA has allowed me to live my passion and my values, but it's really done more for, that, for me than that. It allowed me to fill this void that I had since childhood of wanting to see families unite around a dining room table. If you're given the opportunity to help people in need, give the very best you can for as long as you can in any way that you can. Thank you very much. If you disrespected me, it was a fight because I had to stand up for myself. And then my, my grandmother's uncle would come home at Christmas time and check us to see how many fights had you been in. That was the culture that I grew up in. And now I'm in law school and they're telling me it's a crime. So eventually when I came and became a criminal prosecutor, you can believe that I took the lessons that I learned and grew up with. And I had compassion, one, for the victim. Because again, while I was always fighting, I didn't start a fight. And that was the rule in the house. We couldn't start a fight, but we couldn't back down from a fight. And so I knew what it was like to be a victim, to be picked on, to be teased, to be less than. So when I started prosecuting, I started looking at the assaults I was coming across my desk. What's feeding this stuff? What's the anger? Why the anger? Who are the victims? And you start talking with people and hearing their stories and recognizing what restorative justice is. What can we do to make it right? And not only for the victim, but also for the perpetrator. Because if we don't fix that issue, there are going to be more victims. There are going to be more issues. There are going to be more problems. And so I reached all the way back in my path and past and collided, bringing people together. I'm going to tell you that my family, especially my father and my mother, were pillars of the community, people who would do all kinds of things for others without looking for a reward or personal gain. And that was something that was, it was inculcated in all of us. When you do things, do them quietly. You know, don't splash. You don't need to get more than what you need. Be satisfied because otherwise it's just a waste. In being able to look at being good enough, in being to have this humility that is sometimes taught to us, and especially how women are taught, you know, that don't expect to get, you know, more than what you've got, you know, or be happy with what you have. You know, it's just not good enough. We have to leap. We have to just go beyond what we think is comfortable. And, and get into the discomfort because it's about jumping into the pool instead of just dangling your feet and just kind of getting them wet. As a woman, as a woman of color, I am used to being underestimated. 
Every time I've run for office or thought about running for office, I was told I would lose. I've had someone try to talk me out of it. I've been told to wait my turn. And sometimes that advice was good. But whenever I decided to pursue running for office, I have always won. So I think there's an opportunity there to think about what quiet confident means and always remembering for me, you have to be twice as good to get half as much. I think we often underestimate, especially in today's climate, the ability to stand back, listen, take stock, and not have a knee-jerk reaction to every slight, to every word, to every crazy post on social media, and just taking the time to get the facts and find out what's what. Sometimes things end up taking care of themselves, and you don't have to do anything except rise above the fray. And sometimes you need to get your hands dirty and get in there. But you do so from a place of power when you take the time to be patient, to look at the whole scene, and sometimes just letting some of the drama play itself out. I'm a pretty complicated person myself. And one of the things that, that I believe and that I see in our society is that we're much more comfortable letting men be complicated than women. And when I think about having a daughter, I don't want her to face that double standard. And so my grandmother would have never called herself a feminist, but, but here's the thing. She was the strongest person I ever knew. Man or woman, I don't know anybody in my entire life who lived their life more on their own terms than my grandmother. And so it is we, uh, we decided to name our daughter Eden Marie Noel Monroe. I would like to conclude with a few of mom's axioms. It's all in your head. Always be positive. It's easier. Don't ever look back. Marry a woman with less problems than you. <laughs> and I did. Look for the nickel under the foot. Tacoma is the center of the universe. And remember, Mount Tacoma, not that other name. And most importantly, don't ever give up, ever. So you guys have been through so many lives in such a short time, and I want to give you a little heads up about the way that stories work in the brain. As you listen to people take you inside their lives, Great stories like these click on a movie camera in your head. And perhaps you've actually formed your own memories. You've seen that horse farm. You've seen that karate school. You've been to Birmingham, Alabama. You've been to these places. And the beauty is that with stories, your brain is going to lodge those as though they were your own memories. Those stories are going to be within you. But there's a second way that stories work, and it's going to start happening here in just a few minutes and as you go home today. When you listen to other people's stories, it begins to bring up your own memories, your own memories of things that have happened, your own lessons, and they're asking to be told. The very best stories trigger you to tell your own story. So as you process these lessons and these experiences from other people, I also want to invite you to listen carefully to the story inside of you that's asking to be let up because you have wisdom to share as well. Thank you.